All right. Well, welcome to the Cosmo webinar. Uh, here at, at Cosmo, we are nothing if not uh, resourceful. We go to plans B, C, and D pretty regularly. So I'm sorry you cannot see the smiling face of um, our, our friend and resource person, Brian Crockett, but um, I assure you that he is smiling where he is. And uh, he, in fact, I told you he was in Iowa uh, where he gave the keynote at the Iowa conference earlier this morning. And I'm really grateful that he made time to do this today, even though Obviously, it is not the most convenient of circumstances. Uh, so we will have Brian on the phone and we will be able to see his PowerPoint. You just won't be able to see him. So uh, with, with all of that, um, let me just say to anyone I don't know, my name is Ruth Ann Rugg. I am the transitional leader for COSMA. Um, I also work part-time for Texas Association of Museums, and it is Texas Association of Museums that we have to thank today for um, allowing us to borrow their webinar platform. Um, they weren't using it, and we are, so I think that's a, a, a pretty good uh, bargain. Uh, Brian Crockett has uh, worked in the museum industry, the history industry, all over the nonprofit field for at least the last three decades. And uh, he has done tremendous work, uh, not only with the states, not only with individual organizations um, and other state associations, but also has done major work with uh, the NEH, National Endowment for Humanities, and the Mid-America Arts Alliance, where he's working on a project right now. Um, he knows a great deal about leadership and governance, and that is why I asked him to do this today, because we all occasionally have some questions or difficulties with the leadership at our state museum association. So I have asked him to just introduce himself very briefly, um, that was not a very good introduction, so I'm going to let him talk to you. That was a great one. And uh, with no further ado, I will turn you over to Brian. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ruthann, and thanks for what was a, a very, very generous introduction. I don't uh, don't deserve any sort of uh, kind words at all. So, um, bottom line here is that I I love Cosma. I love the notion behind it. I I thank each and every one of you for the good work that you do in your states. And if this can help us all move ahead a little bit in terms of good governance, then it'll make our, all of our lives better. So um, again, thank you for the good work that you do. And I'm so sorry that um, we're, we're just a little bit uh, out, of, uh, out of the tech sorts this morning. Or is it this afternoon? I guess it would be this afternoon. At any rate, um, welcome. Let's see if we can get to business. So applying Lysol to the sense of power the idea here is that um, there are some ways for us to clean up sort of bad um, board behavior. And so what I'm gonna do here over the next um, several minutes is kind of go through the basic rules for any of you who don't know what they are. They're always a good idea to be reminded of them. Then we're going to look at some of the, the preferred behaviors. And if we've got opportunity um, uh, to take some questions about specific dysfunction, let's see if we can't make um, some space and time for that as well. Okay, so Jennifer, if you'll go to the next one. So today's topics, if you, I'm not sure if you all see it. Is it advancing, guys? Can someone tell me? Yes, yes, it okay. is. And Thank you. Okay. Yes. You know, Brian, it occurs to me that we might should uh, introduce Jennifer, who is the power behind the screen at the moment. Jennifer Coleman um, has done a great deal of work for Cosma and for TAM, and she is is uh, joining us from Colorado today. So thank you, Jennifer, for saving the day. Saving the day. Thank you, Jennifer. So you um, today's topics, today's topics, I want to roll through, um, obviously, the basics of a 501c3, our collective roles and responsibilities as board members, and then the individual roles among board members. If we've got some time, as I mentioned, for Q&A, let's talk about all the various ways in which we're really, really awful to one another and how it is that we can be better um, and then have more fun at this all of this venture. So move ahead, please. So good governance, the board's role. Let's go one more. The the um, 501c 501c tax exempt designations. For those of you who don't know, there are over 71,000 in 2002 of the 501c sixes. 
So, well, I guess it's just well over 100,000 501c6s. Um, C6s are the ones you see halfway through the screen. Those are our business leagues and chambers of commerce. Up until just last year, the National Football League was a 501c6. Basically, a C6 is an organization that is there only to um, advance the business prospects of a certain sort of group or club, which is why chambers of commerce fit in that group. But we are the C3s, the, and by far we are the, the dominant group in terms of um, de the tax designation there. Um, they, um, I'm not sure we need to know too much more about that, except that um, we, we are the biggest chunk of them. We're talking now about upwards of 2 million, and we don't know how many there really are in the, um, that are actually active. Um, and, and if you get really geeky about this, you can go down to like the C-13 and see cemetery companies and C-21, the Black Lung Benefit Trust, if you really want to know. Uh, let's move ahead, please. So, so one thing to keep in mind is that there's no preferred um, model of governance to emulate here. Factors of, the factors of purpose, size, complexity in the organization, whether it's membership-based or not, all determine how it is that you can govern yourselves. So there's a lot of variety in how it is that you can put together your, your own C3 organization. Um, whether or not, uh, what the sources of revenue is one of the things that really tends to um, reshape uh, how it is that we each um, figure out what's best for our organization. There are preferred governance models of, ver of very various kinds, and sometimes boards of directors mess that up a little bit because their experience comes from different um, vantage points. Let's go to the next one. So your board of directors are also known as your trustees. You see this motley crew here, which is pretty a pretty healthy sample, I think, of most of our of uh, our state museum association trustees. But why are they known as trustees? Trustees is a really good and important word because it says what it means, which is that they hold the public's trust. All of these organizations, all of our nonprofits, are held in the public trust. They are the public expression of ownership and oversight. So the board of directors is really critical, and I know that board members sometimes we use lots of different language, but trustees is really apropos. Keep that in mind as we move forward. Next slide. A quick reminder here of, a board, of the board's legal authority. A board's legal authority and the responsibilities of its individual members are distinct. So think about that just for a moment if you would. The legal authority and responsibilities of its individual members are distinct. That comes uh, with a high cost for a lot of people who like to be bullies on their boards, they, when, once they understand that notion. Second point there, individual board members have no legal authority except when they make decisions as part of a legally constituted corporate body. This is the thing that keeps us from having bullies on our board, or ideally, that, that um, they recognize that outside of the construct of the board itself, they have no individual, they have no authority. Their authority comes only by way of the collective, of the corporate body. So um, this is a real, if you are in a situation in which you have sort of um, board members that have run amok or are working um, individually and, and speaking on behalf of the board um, when they really shouldn't, this is a good legal reminder. Let's go to the next slide. So the th these, these, this reminder here of the board's legal duties is critical because this is the place in which um, boards of directors are sued. Now, it doesn't happen very often. I mean, truthfully, given the sheer numbers of, of um, nonprofit organizations in this country, it's very, very rare that they get in, in uh, trouble. But sometimes they do. And if when a board um, uh, strays outside of these three duties, that's typically when you get problems. So the first one, of course, is the duty of care which is your um, uh, promise to avoid negligence, your adherence to a standard of reasonable care while performing any acts that can foreseeably harm other, others. It is a first element that must be established to proceed with any action in negligence. So basically, the first duty, duty of care, just care. Just avoid negligence, ensure that what you do um, demonstrates that you, um, you were diligent in your pursuit of something that would not be negligent. The second one is due to duty of loyalty. This is your conflict of interest, that you must put the organization's or corporation's interest ahead of your own. So this is basically to ensure that you there's no personal or professional interest that comes first. And the third one is a duty of obedience. 
that you remain faithful to the goals and the bylaws, that you, that you ensure the resources are not diverted in some other extraneous way, um, and that you guard the mission at every turn. So with this in mind, boards must comply with applicable federal, state, and local laws. They have to make sure and be certain that they're um, in harmony with good, good intent. Let's go to the next one here. So again, your collective leadership. So you have your fiduciary responsibility, but responsibilities. They are that you are the trustees of the organization's assets, that you exercise due diligence to ensure that your museum, and, or in your case, that, um, that your state association is well managed and that the financial situation remains sound. And board members must stay objective, unselfish, responsible, honest, trustworthy, and efficient. This slide itself is probably just enough for you to review with each one of your boards. Um, as opposed to getting in the legalese of the, the previous one. Okay, the next slide here. Individual leadership. So apart from the, the uh, collective, there, is, there are some elements of individual leadership that I'm gonna go into in just a, a moment. But as stewards of the public trust, you must act for the good of your organization and not yourself. You must exercise reasonable care and decision-making and not put your organization at risk and you must stay objective unselfish, responsible, honest, trustworthy, and efficient. So I know many of you are putting those words to music at present, or maybe figuring out how you can make them all haikus. Uh, good on you. And if, you, if you've come up with a good one that you can carry in your wallet, please share it with me. Let's go to the next slide. So now we get into the 10 basic responsibilities of any nonprofit board. These are your collective responsibilities as you exercise your, your, uh, your authority as trustees. They come to us by way of board source. Many of you will know board source is kind of the big dog when it comes to nonprofit um, sort of management as well as oversight. Um, they're just a, 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 a nice place where a lot of good folks who stew on this stuff and are get really geeky about it tend to write good pamphlets and good books and, and they tend to like be ahead of the game when it comes to where people, what people are thinking about when it comes to nonprofit governance. They obviously are not specific to the arts or the humanities or history or science or any, any parts of museum world. They really are specific to nonprofits generally. This is a good place to start in part because you get to move between various um, uh, disciplines without any trouble uh, among your board. So this comes from, from um, as I said, board source. Richard Ingram came up with these, these uh, 10 basic responsibilities some time ago. They, ha they are um, actually updated about every three or four years as things change. And I'll note one of those as we go through this. Go to the next slide, please. So the, your first obligation as, as a board is to determine the mission and purposes of your board and advocate for them, okay? Next slide, please. Which means then that the questions your board should ask under mission and purpose are these. Do we consider our purpose in making decisions? Have we recently reaffirmed our mission? What new or emerging changes to our circumstances should cause a reconsideration of our mission? So again, mission and purpose defined by the board. Now, as we know, new board members come forward and they either accept the, the mission as is, or they have periodic opportunities to ensure that it can be um, updated. Number two, please. Let's go to the next slide. The, it's the board responsibility to select the chief executive. And in this, in, let me go to the next slide, please. So the questions that your board should be asking when it comes to this piece is what process do we have for supporting and retaining our chief executive? Does our CEO or our ED have a strong job description? Have we agreed on the goals and priorities for the chief executive for the coming year? And what about succession planning? Now we know that this can get pretty um, icky a little bit when we, when we start thinking about having a, um, um, a staff member, right? And in, in some instances, in, in the vast majority of nonprofits, there is no staff member. There's someone who occupies the, the spate of sort of the head of the board as well as the, the chief executive. And it gets really, really messy. It's much easier when the uh, line is drawn clearly and it's designated. So, um, but, but the, the, the key here is, is the second uh, responsibility of a board is to select the chief executive. Let's go to the next slide, please. Your number, th the, the third responsibility is to support and evaluate the chief executive. This is 
super critical here because essentially your board has only one of two things to do. That is to support and evaluate the chief executive or to fire the chief executive. There isn't any wiggle room in this one way or another. You either get all behind him or her or you get them out the door. So uh, you can't be wishy or wishy-washy about your chief executive and because it's necessary for you to be able to gain public confidence and, and exact your mission. So, the, so let me move to the next slide, please. The questions your board should ask in terms of su supporting the chief executive, what is our policy for assessing the performance of our executive director? How recently have we reviewed our assessment and compensation policies? And who is in charge of implementing these policies? So those are just a, a few questions that your board should be considering when it comes to this responsibility. Let's go to the next slide. The fourth um, responsibility is to ensure effective planning. It's the board's response, the responsibility. It's, it's their, their charge in order to make sure that planning occurs generally. Let's go to the next slide. And the questions that our board asks here are, do, we, do our meetings include some strategic thinking? Do you actually step back and, and consider sort of what's um, what's coming down the pike as opposed to um, just uh, in front of you? Do you have a strategic plan? And does it take into account things like demographic and social and economic factors? Are we responsive to the needs of our stakeholders? Who do we serve, that is? So the board should be asking the big questions about who do we serve and how do we manage them? How do we, how do we ensure that we're still serving and serving in the right ways? So that last ball that you see, for instance, how do we measure our impact? What metrics do we use? How do we actually know we're doing any good? Because boards can fool themselves into thinking that they are effective when in fact they're not. Let's go to the next slide. So the fifth one is monitor and strengthen our programs and services. Next slide. It's the board's responsibility to ask these questions. What information do we need to assess our effectiveness in our programmatic activity? What difference are we trying to make? How do we know whether we are making a difference? What are our signature programs and services? That is, how, does it, how do our audiences or how do our constituents or our members understand us? Do we, do we see ourselves in the same way they do? And do we have activities that are peripheral? What, what needs to be discontinued and do we get, need to get rid of? Let's go to the next slide. So Ruth Ann, are you still on the phone? Yes, Ruth, I'm here. Out there? You yes, are? I'm here. Can you Ruth? hear me? Yeah. Yes. Do you see what slide do you see right now? I see a slide of the two of us back in the 60s. That's right. That's right. I think it is the two of us. Um, we're we're. This is when we were in Italy. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I'm just hoping. I'm hoping everyone can really take in that 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 silk that silk that's draping across my hairy chest that's really the key i think okay. brian there are but, probably people on online who are too young to really know who this is it's not yeah, really we'll have them we'll have them sort of <laughs> just uh, uh they, they can uh they can send it in you know they can send it in and maybe get a prize okay all right let's go to the next slide ensuring adequate resources that's the job of the board here so that's our number six one do we need to develop more diverse revenue sources? The answer there is always yes. Do we have adequate financial reserves? You know, what, what happens if we, if we run out of money? Do we have a contingency financial plan? Is there a clear understanding of board roles and fundraising? All of these, again, are number six, the responsibility of the board collectively. Let's go to number seven, please. Protect our assets and provide financial oversight. This is the seventh responsibility of collective responsibility of a board. Let's go to the next one. And the questions that your board should be asking are, do we conduct an independent annual audit? Now, that can be expensive and lots of organizations have found ways to do it in other ways where they do a, like a full audit every three years, even five years, and then have someone that, that's capable and competent to look in on um, the numbers and give it a, an okay every every year. But nevertheless, there need to be outside eyes on your budget and your expenses. So do we have board members with financial management, accounting, or other business expertise? Are our financial statements reliable, timely, and easy to understand? That's often a problem among boards. 
particularly if it's an old board that is accustomed to doing things in one particular way. And when they come to the board, they recognize that they don't that they sort of play along as if they understand the the uh, the, risk, the financial reports, but they have no earthly idea about what, what's really happening in front of them. So, do we have short and long-term financial strategies? Is another important piece. Let's go to the next slide. So this is um, uh, the age responsibility is to build and sustain a competent board. And you see there in the photograph there, the, the least um, um, competent board that you might ever um, find. It's actually uh, a, a very satanic uh, photograph from uh, Kansas Historical Society. Okay, let's move on. Um, so the questions that our board asks here, number eight, is what is uh, what constitutes a balanced board? How do we figure out um, you know, what size, talents, and demographics and affiliations are necessary for us to be representative? Do we have strong board job description, responsibilities, and expectations? If you're there at home or in the office right now, that's the one single thing you should be writing down right now, is if you can fix your board tomorrow, do just that, okay? Term limits, gotta have them, should always have them. I'm not like iffy on this. I think that term limits um, are the, is the, is the only real way that we can stay effective over time. So um, governance committee, do you have one of those? Often, depending on the size of your of your board, that can that need, that duty needs to be managed whether you're it's in committee or not. But you have to have someone that uh, like protects the governance aspect of the board. Um, do you have effective board orientations and regular board governance training? Let's go to the next slide. So number nine is um, ensure legal and ethical integrity and maintain accountability. That's the key there. Okay. Next slide. The questions the board should ask in this, uh, with this responsibility, do we understand and implement conflict of interest, whistleblower, and document retention policies? Those three policies are required by the feds for any nonprofit organization, so you've got them whether you know it or not, if you're in good standing, that is. The second one is, do we conduct an independent audit, which came up before? Are we adequately transparent? Do we issue an annual report? Are we in full government compliance? Um, and then we look at the bottom, do we document our advocacy and lobbying activities? This is one that gets quite a bit of attention. Um, and it's, it's, it's really sad for all of us that, that we have to worry that we're, we've run too close to, um, to the flame when it comes to lobbying. But, it's, but it is the obligation of every board to be an advocate for their position and for their organization. So some people are scared off by it. The last, um, let's go to the next slide, please. Number 10 is to enhance the organization's public standing. Okay, let's go to the next one. Do we regularly discuss our board's collective advocacy efforts? Do we actively monitor our public policy changes, threats, and opportunities? So think about this, collective advocacy efforts. If you believe in your, in your um, organization's mission, then you need to be singing it loud and proud. That's very different than actually uh, coming forward as, as a lobbyist and endorsing or getting behind or even financing different pieces of legislation. You must always be, as a good member, a good board member, an advocate for your cause. So that's, again, a confusion that often occurs and scares people off, but it really shouldn't. So the second one there is, do we actively monitor public policy changes, threats, and opportunities? Are we looking to the horizon for for what the issues are that are um, coming before our museum community. Do we have a formal method and hierarchy and who speaks for the organization? That's really critical. I'm working with an organization at present where that tends to be a problem and we sort of have to figure out how to silence a couple of members in order for there to be just a single voice. And finally, do we communicate regularly and effectively with our members and our stakeholders? Do they know what we're up to? Do they understand that they also, as the public, um, have an interest in our good work? So the next slide, if we would. This is our pause now. Are there questions at this point? Anybody want to chime in, or 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 do we want to leave that to the end, Ruth Ann? Well, I think um, I think probably it's better at the end. Although I was so worried about getting you on that I neglected to tell people about how to uh, write their questions down on the bottom. They can um, they can uh, 
type into either the question or the chat and we can get to them. At the end, we will be able to like quote unquote call on you and unmute you so that you can ask your question. So if, if there's something oh. you're worried you, you will forget, go ahead and write it down, but otherwise let's wait till the end. Okay, okay, good. Um, I guess this might be a good place to acknowledge um, that uh, We've seen some really awful, awful, I mean, I personally have seen a whole lot of bad behavior. I know any one of us that has been around nonprofit boards for a good stretch has seen some really ugly, ugly um, moments. Um, I have seen boards that uh, have come to fisticuffs. I've seen boards where cops had to be called in order to separate, you know, just standing uh, committees of boards. I've seen board members um, pull all kinds of shenanigans, the most grotesque things that you could ever imagine. Like uh, uh, one, I remember one in Nebraska where there was a, a one board member that took out a mental health alert on another board member in a small town at a museum once. That was you know, just really, really tough, tough stuff. So then she did the same to the other one and it just like went on and on and on. But people um, tend to believe somehow that uh, a, a board is the perfect place for them to exercise their own ego. And it really shouldn't be. It's a place of sort of community interest and collective um, action. So when you find bad behavior among board members, which is runs rampant, um, it, it, there are ways in which you can treat it um, th that are forceful and those that are uh, very humane. But if we all know what our best behavior is, then we have a better shot at, at just um, advancing our interests. Let's go to the next slide, please. So here we go, good governance, the board member's role. Now this is separate, of, of course, from what we just um, heard in terms of the collective role. So move ahead, please. Now here's your quick reminder, all right? So your fiduciary responsibilities, you remember those before, right? With the loyalty and the care. Um, so as, you, as you stewards of the public trust, you must act for the good of your organization and not yourself which means then that you can't have anybody um, using the information that's shared on the board for their own personal interest. They can't figure out some, uh, some sort of scheme where they get access and, um, and decide that the, you know, their state association is moving in such a way that there's a great investment they can make or that they can, they can uh, I don't know, they can, they can put more coins in their pocket if they just have them meet at their place or little things like that, okay? The second one is that you have to exercise that reasonable care and decision making and never put your organization at risk. That it's up to you to ensure that the organization itself is, is secure. And the last one is that board members individually must stay objective, unselfish, responsible, honest, trustworthy, and efficient. So you'll see that those actually um, are the parallel to the duty of care and loyalty and obedience. Let's go to the next slide. A couple little um, just quick reminders here regarding leadership and leadership generally, okay? These, are, these tend to be the kinds of things that we think of now as adaptive leadership, which is sort of the softer side of, of the rules. But just some things to keep in mind, okay? The first little one is that leadership has been hijacked in popular culture to mean heroic leadership, which is kind of bad news for everybody because it, it isolates our ability to be able to think that I'm, I have a responsibility to be a leader. The second note here is that real day-to-day -day leadership is typically more mundane and more straightforward. And the third one is leadership is best explained simply, which is just helping a group of two or more people achieve a, their common goals, right? To be present, to actually sort of help guide. The fourth one is anyone can engage in acts of leadership at any time. We sometimes find boards, particularly among really old museums and sometimes um, uh, among arts and cultural organizations, they tend to be really big ones like, uh, like symphonies or operas in which leadership is designated from afar. It's kind of like a, you know, anointing a king or a queen and um, people don't take any responsibility by virtue of it being someplace else. But anyone can engage in acts of leadership at any time. The fifth one is you don't have to be the designated leader to lead. And the sixth one is charisma, brilliance, intelligence, or position aren't necessary to lead. That's some um, self-evident here, um, particularly um, um, among um, any, any group that I'm ever part of. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so let's think about just best behaviors here among the board. The first one is you must be unselfish, right? 
but the characteristics to effectively lead on a board begins here. This just ain't about you. When you sit at the board table, you represent a particular interest or constituency, but you must act on behalf of the interests of the organization. That is, you must be unselfish, okay? Let's go to the next one. You must be responsible and exercise care, okay? So this hints back at your legal obligations on the board as a board member. But if you elect to serve your organization, then you've made a public commitment to exercise discretion, responsibility, and care. So what does that mean in real terms? That if you have a board member who mailing it in, who's mailing it in, and is not exercising any of those things, they're actually out of compliance, both legally as well as collectively, and, and builds a whole lot of resentment on your board. Um, you must exercise care. You've got to show and give a hand. Okay, the next one, please. You must be honest and objective. This is a big, uh, a big deal for nonprofits of a different sort. We don't seem to have much problem with this in the museum world, but does your organization tell the truth? If not, can, it, can you tell the truth as a board member? And do you know how to um, navigate between your organization's public statements and your truth as a board member? So there is a little bit of uh, um, some, there's difficulty there, right? Because as an individual um, on, a, on the board, you fight for what you believe is right. You know, in, as long as you're employing objectivity as well as honesty, it's your, it's your duty to do um, that. But it's also, if you've given a good fight and it didn't come out your way, it's also your duty to be supportive of the whole. So this is, this is a kind of a learned behavior. The more time you're on a board, the better you get at that, I would say. And I'd love to hear your comments and questions on that. So the next one is you must be passionate. You've got to be passionate about your, about your work. You must demonstrate a consistency of purpose in your passion and be an unapologetic fan of your organization and speak very, very highly of it. So it's important for you to recognize that your, um, your work, hmm, you speak for the board even when you don't want to speak for the board or shouldn't be speaking for the board. That others look at you, they understand whether or not you're behind the organization or you're not. And if you, and if you demonstrate in some way there's no consistency of purpose here in your passion, then those who are, are meant to support the organization will understand it and you will have undone the board's social capital, that is its reputation. So you're actually out of compliance legally, but you're also just ethically or at least demonstrably um, not doing what you should be. The best way to be a leader here is to be passionate. And that means be passionate even when you lose the game, right? Just make sure that you're always aligned with your organization. Let's go to the next slide, please. One of the pieces that's most muddy among all nonprofits, but particularly those that don't have paid employees, is the difference between board and staff roles. So the board and the staff occupy very different stations. Board members focus on policy and strategy, and staff members focus on implementation. Let me say that again, because it's really, really important. So if you're a board member, you focus specifically at the, at you look to the horizon. You're thinking about policy, and that is that what governs your organization, and strategy, how it is you're gonna pay for things, what demographic changes there are ahead, how can you navigate the waters of your mission, right? And the staff members focus on how it is that we put, we, we exact that, policy and strategy. There is a very clear line between the two of them. And most board um, problems occur in which, particularly among all um, volunteer organizations, when we can no longer figure out who's on the board side and who's on the staff side. But if you get this piece right, if you're an organization that has one paid employee at the very least, then a lot of your board problems will go away. The fuzzy part is when you ask your board to also be volunteers as they are at each one of your state museum association conferences, right? Where everybody seems to be pitching in, but it's very, very important to understand that there's a line between board and staff and that when a, when a board member decides that um, uh, she's gonna be in charge of the ticketing at the special event at the state museum conference, that she's not acting as a board member in that role. She's acting as a volunteer to the organization, which is technically beneath the paid staff in terms of authority. So she reports to the staff member in that instance, and she is, and she has, she is, um, she's, she's not acting as a board member. That's, the, I guess, the key. But let's talk about that if there is time at the end too. Let's go to the next slide. 
So then finally, in terms of just quick uh, and behavioral elements to, to um, individual board members, things to keep in mind here. One is that you need to know your mission. Got to be the mission, mission, mission. If you've got a strong mission, then most things go, many problems go away. Um, if you don't have a good mission, then what's the point? Get working on your mission, okay? So um, listen before leading. It's always better to figure out um, before you, you believe you know something, listen to, to what the, uh, the problems are. Be prudent and honest. Have fun. Be an unapologetic evangelist about your organization. Show up and foster new leaders. So among those that I, I want to um, take just a moment to say something more about, one is show up. I can't tell you what a difference it is, a difference maker it is in the effectiveness of boards when, um, when we have a, a culture in the board in which people show up, they show up on time. When they run webinars like this one, you know, there's no technical um, problems. They just, uh, it just takes care of itself. But the, um, that actually is a joke. It's really fun to, you know, like make a joke when there's no audience at all. At any rate, um, so showing up is a big deal. Do it. it. It changes the culture of the board. It changes if people, if you, were, if you respect the agenda, if you finish on time, if you, if you stay within your lanes in terms of um, deliberation and action, it makes the, the entire organization run, run better um, because there's a sense of uh, purpose. There's a sense that the cause is, is worth fighting for and the professionalization is the only, only way forward. So um, that's one I want to look at. The other one is to um, foster new leaders. People who get ingrained in their organizations and can't be moved. We see this a lot among museums, not so much among state associations, but, but um, fostering new leaders is really the best way for you to acknowledge that the role of a museum is for all time, not just for this time. That you have to actually, um, when you're thinking about leadership for the future, you're, you're exacting your mission and ensuring that the, that the institution has a future. Um, and it can't be done if uh, you have just the same people on the board forevermore. Okay, so let's go to the next one because this is the most important one to take a look at, and that is have fun. Have fun, right? If this work is not joyful, then you can't advance it. The hardest thing in the world to do is to get people to show up when they know that every board meeting is a fight or that everything that it's very boring or that there's nothing that will come of it um, if they can't see that there's progress in some way but the best way always to get after this is to recognize that your social capital that is the fun times that you have and the and the and the uh, joy that comes from public service is shared among all board members that cures most um, ills among boards very very quickly so I wanted to you know, play that one out for sure. Now, the next one here is I just have um, for you finally here, and we, I, this will leave us with about 15 minutes left, some of the favorite nonprofit governance resources that are out there. And I'd love to hear from you all about um, the ones that you look to. The ones that I would play up right now, the National Council for Nonprofits, the very last one on this list here, is one that we all need to be taking um, advantage of at present. There's so much going on in terms of the nonprofit world, but also that affects those of us in the museum world, um, especially when we think about the Johnson Amendment, for those of you that are, are familiar with that. The National Council, this is, our, this is the family that we're a part of and one that we should take a, a good, uh, we should be part of all the time, I guess. And I would just sign up for, for that one if you're not part of it. The other one is that it used to be called Nonprofits with Balls. It's now nonprofitaf.com. Um, and I don't know if any of you follow Vu up in Washington State, but he writes a column weekly about different aspects of nonprofit work, and he's, um, he's irreverent in good ways, and he's very passionate about what he's, he's doing. In fact, if you guys hang up today and go look at nonprofitaf.com and see his, uh, his most recent um, uh, post, I thought it was very, very powerful and one that we should all be paying attention to. So just some, some, some resources along the way, and I'd love to hear some places that you follow as well. So that's it. If you go to the last slide, applying Lysol to the stench of power. It's kind of a funky way to do this when I can't hear anyone else on the, on the uh, other end of the phone. But um, I'd love to take some questions or discuss anything that you all might have one way or another. Um, and thank you uh, for this opportunity. Thank you, Brian. Thunderous applause. 
Um, we do have a couple <laughs> of questions from people who wrote in the question part. And um, the first one, which I should have mentioned earlier, is yes, we will make the PowerPoint available to you. Um, we will we'll attach it down there by handouts um, near the end. So uh, if you were taking copious notes, that's probably so you will remember it, but you will be able to get a copy of this. Uh, we had a question from uh, Janice Klein in Arizona asking how many of us really um, do get an annual aud audit. Um, I'm not sure how to uh, ask everybody that, but uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I'm not sure. Let's see. I, Janice, let me unmute you. And you, would, would you like to say something about that? Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, maybe people who do can say yes or I don't know. Um, it's a, If you don't have an, a regular auditor, it's, it seems to be a difficult thing to start. Um, and also the size of most of our budgets sort of make the, the what we do in terms of financial activity um, to, to have a full audit is a little bit of overkill. So I'm sort of curious about what what other associations do for for an all. Um, whether they bring in the gun and, and everything looked at and really all we're saying here are bank statements, here are our invoices. Um, well, you had a couple of your colleagues uh, answered in the questions. Uh, Jonna McEntee from Ohio says, yes, they do an annual audit every year. And Della Hall from Alaska says they do not, and they've heard that it's pretty pricey. So let's see, I see another hand. Let me call on Amy, let's see if I can unmute you, Amy. I may not be able to, whoops. I don't think I can do it. I'm so sorry. Let, let me go read the questions some more. Jonna, I just unmuted you. Would you like to say something about your audit? Whoops. Okay, well, maybe not. Um, I don't, I'm not very good at operating this either. I'm so sorry. Um, so several people are answering in the question section. So let mm -hmm. me go see what it says. Um, Sarah, uh, Missouri, um, the Missouri Association of Museums and Archives does not, but the financials are not that complicated and are also very clear. So that's one approach. Um, Texas does. Uh, we do a, an independent audit every year and it is very expensive, but um, it, I, I think it's important to have that uh, independent eye look at it. Let's see. Uh, Savannah, Jan. Hi, hi, Jan. Yes, they do um, an annual audit, uh, but that was Missouri as well. So, all right. Shall we move to an Hello, Christina, I lost you. Okay, um, just me. Let's, let's, let's go back to one of the other questions that you asked, which was about uh, board members who act as sort of staff because there's no staff. I know a number mm -hmm. of our state museum associations are volunteer run. And I think the gray area can get a little um, a little uncomfortable sometimes. Are there any tips that you can give us about how to uh, keep the lines drawn in a balanced way? Sure. So, so you know, the, the worst kind of board dysfunction occurs where the mission isn't clear. Or we have organ that we have members that have been on for way too long. But if you if you start with your mission and it's very obvious what it is you're up to, then it's easy to call one another out when they don't fill their roles, when they don't when they don't you know if they step outside of their roles. So and you can do it joyfully. Board members can be fired. 
and board members often need to be fired. But their role as a volunteer can happen uh, with some, let me, I'll tell you some, some ways in which we do it in, in small museums where we have all volunteer organizations top to bottom and there's no paid employee. And that is that when a board member, when she sits at her board meeting for the museum um, and, she, and she stands up and she moves into the gallery, she actually transfers her authority, right, from the collective to being a volunteer. And when she's a volunteer, in some instances, particularly in small rural places where that's always everybody doing the same thing, um, we'd make them change hats or put on a vest or put a big button or something on themselves that say volunteer. So they recognize that they can't decide where anything goes in the museum. They can't bully anyone. They have to understand that they report now to the, um, to the executive director and that executive director can be paid or unpaid. But there is a very different line of authority that's, that's applied there. So you can do it in fun ways. If you can make fun of yourself and forgive it when you screw up, that's another big important part, is if the entire board says, hey, we gotta get better at this, let's spend the next year working at it in terms of our, our roles and responsibilities and the, and the lines of communication. And when we blow it, that's okay too. We all know that the cause is a good one and we just pitch in again, but we, um, but we try harder. Did that any, any of that help? Yeah. I don't know if that helped. Yeah, a little bit? A little bit. Yeah. Okay. So earlier I was, I, we're going to go back to the other topic because I was trying to get to Amy and was not having any luck, but she wrote in to okay. and does an audit annually through a bid process. Uh, we found that mm. it helps us to attract contributions from foundations. It is expensive, but it helps us to bring in funds. Yeah, that's some, um, that's, that's another aspect of that. Okay. Mm. So I'm scanning. If there's any other kind of question, if not, we are I, I would love to know what people are, are afraid of. I mean, what's the, what's the, what's the, uh, among state associations, what's their biggest problem when it comes to um, good governance? You can either write it down or give me a sign and I'll try to call on you and unmute you. In the interim, I'm really happy to hear Alaska's on the phone. That's pretty cool. We get really good participation. Okay, well, there goes my dog. We have someone interested in either serving um, now. let me see if I can do this. We, we have someone interested in either serving on the board or as an ex officio board member who runs similar grant programs as we do to the same audience. Serving in either of these roles would give this person insider information about our grants that may be used to run their own grant program. Should our board consider this a conflict of interest? On the face of it, it sounds like a conflict, if I'm understanding it correctly. The, 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 the first and most obvious question is, why is, this, uh, why is this not an issue for the person that, that occupies this, this place or this space? They're the ones that should recognize the conflict um, first and foremost and come forward because it puts the rest of the board in kind of a tricky situation to call it out. But... Absolutely. I, I mean, if you if you if you look way back in terms of uh, what those what our obligations are, one of the first one is to ensure that they're not finding some way to advance their own personal um, agenda. Now, if they're doing it on behalf of a different or a different group, then and that group is related to the museum field, then maybe that's exactly what you want. Maybe that's influence in a spot that makes sense. But if you think there's favoritism being at, at play, then I'd have a conversation with that board member. Molly, I'm going to try to unmute you and see if you have a, a follow up for that. Um, no, I think that pretty much answers it. The problem is um, this person is also a member. Um, so it's it's one of our museums in the state um, and somebody who works at one of them who would potentially be um, interested in coming onto the board. So it's kind of a tricky situation because we've never had like a policy where we can say something like um, 
certain members cannot be on the board. So it just seems it's kind of a tricky thing for us right now. Yeah. Uh, say, say, say again for me what um what the worst case scenario is for this person being on the board. What's at risk? Um. I just I just feel weird about it. I don't know how else to say it. Is it just seems like um, it's like an ulterior motive for joining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Un unfortunately, lots of people have their own motivations for joining boards. You see that among if you get really geeky about this kind of stuff, you'll find that some people have you know categorized board members in lots of different funky ways. If this person is a climber or just loves power, then it um, then it can get it, it's a it's that it doesn't feel right for the sort of ethos of your organization. Then the whole board should say it's not a good fit. But if it's but at, on the other hand, you actually want board members that care. You want board members that see something at stake and are trying to you know make something happen. So if your if your policies are tight, you could probably contain them. Okay. Probably without so knowing more. I'm, I'm going to let Sarah ask a question about balanced representation. Can, Sarah, can you, can we hear you? Um, I don't know that you can. Can you? Yes. Yep. Oh, excellent. Um, Brian had just asked what our, our major um, challenges were at, you know, right now in, with our museum association. It's just really getting balanced representation. Sorry. This day. Um, we have just certain areas in the state where I, I know there are small museums, but um, either they're all volunteer ran or they don't have they have a transitional staff and so that just seems to be a really big challenge for us is getting balanced representation across the state and I guess coming to the realization that you know we can work on it we can try but we may just not get that so it's not really a question as much as an answer there you go <laughs> <laughs> you know what though um uh I think you're right that balance is an ideal right I mean, it's, it's something like, uh, it's, it's a big uh, notion, like it's aspirational, like equity, but um, all you can do is try and be as representative as you can in any given time. There's not gonna be a, a moment in which it's, it's even, it's, it'll ever be fair. I mean, heavens, as we look at, you know, our political situation today, the electoral college doesn't seem very fair, right? But it's, what, it's, it's, the, it's kind of the rules of the game. What you can do is make, is make certain that if this is a group that you serve, that you double down on your service, even if the representation can't always be entirely secured. Thank you. Brian, there's one more, and then we'll let these people go back to work. Yep. Jan, Good. Jan, can you hear me? Jan Glenn, can you, can, are you there still? Maybe not. She had a question about, mm -hmm. um, she had a question about uh, how to, let's see if I can phrase this correct, correctly. She has more issues with getting board members to ask more questions and make suggestions than she has with them interfering. What is a good way to encourage that participation? Wow. Well, the first um, best thing I would say would be um, alcohol. So if she's still there, make sure that your board members are good and drunk at every meeting. All right, that's a joke, just so that we all know, guys. Um, but uh, then the problem there is that you're, you're, there's nothing at stake for them. That's why you're not getting any, any, um, any participation, that you're not pushing hard enough and not being daring enough about what matters to them. So you got to find that soft place where they're vulnerable and hit them there, because then they'll push back, and then, you'll, then you may regret um, what, you've, uh, what, what sort of monster that you've fed. All right. Well, you know, on on that note, the note of the monsters, uh, since it's almost Halloween, we will just end there. Um, <laughs> I will point out to you all that at the bottom of your uh, little dashboard there, there's um, where it says handout. So if you click on that, the PowerPoint slides are there. So you can um, have that and share it with your boards and with um some of, of the other uh, co-workers that who were not able to be with us and let's see I'm going to let you see my smiling face one more time there we are and let me just tell you again thank you so much for uh, making time for Cosma and for being patient with us as we learn this 
process, which is not as intuitive as it may seem. And I really appreciate your questions. Um, you know, truly, our, our strength is together. And the more we mm -hmm. uh, share our questions and our answers and our ideas, the, the stronger we will be. So thank you very much for making time for the Cosmo webinar. We'll be back in a couple of months. And uh, well, thank you to Brian. I wish he could hear us all yep. with our thunderous applause. But thank you so much, Brian, oh, yeah, yeah. for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Anytime I can pitch in with you all, I want to do it. So take care, everyone. Okay. Thanks. Bye.